Hey guys, welcome back. I want to walk you through the notebook for the statistical exercise for Project 7. And this has to do with uh, determining the error associated with a parametric fit. So you've got some model of the situation you're studying. You have some data that you've collected. Um, and you're interested in knowing the, the parameters of the model you like to determine those based on the data you've collected. But the data is not perfect data. It has some uncertainty associated with each of the measurements. And that uncertainty is going to propagate to the uncertainty of the parameters that you find. And not only that, the data might not directly produce an answer, but you might have to do some calculations on that data in, even to be able to inject it into the model. And those calculations are going to also uh, have some associated uncertainty as a result of the fact that the data that you use to do the calculation has uncertainty. So there's this concept of propagation of error, propagation of uncertainty from one set of variables to a calculated set of variables that, you, that derive from the original raw data. So there's two, two problems there. And uh, the main topic today is to understand what's going on with those guys. So. Okay, um, first of all, this first thing is just an example of how we got the data. So if we do a fit here, an exponential fit, say, of some uh, data, we end up with parameters like A and tau or whatever, and those guys have uncertainty. And we used the curve fit co covariance matrix, the diagonals of the covariance matrix, which we got here. Uh, we took the square root of those guys to estimate the uncertainty in the parameters. And there's nothing wrong with that. It actually works very well in most cases. But there is a somewhat more robust way of calculating these uncertainties that gives you a lot more insight into what's actually going on. And it works in cases where the covariance matrix would, would uh, be misled. So I want to explain how that works as well. And there's also another application of... Uh, Monte Carlo error propagation that I'd like to share as well. So, uh, first of all, it's the idea of propagation of error. There's a, a somewhat hypothetical example given in the notebook about a uh, desire to measure the variation of the gravitational field strength as a function of altitude. So, if you go up, the gravitational field strength gets weaker, and a very crude but effective model, as long as you don't go too far, um, is that it's a linear variation. So you'd say, well, look, as I go higher, the, the um, gravitational field gets weaker. And so at a first order approximation, I could think of that as just a linear trend, right? The problem is that I can't just measure g. I don't have any kind of a g meter. Uh, at least we're going to pretend like such a thing doesn't exist. There are such things, in fact. But, um, but what we do have is a meter stick. Uh, actually a two meter stick and a stopwatch and so what we're going to do is simply drop a ball from a fixed height many many times we're going to measure the height of the ball to within what uh, half a centimeter so we're going to measure the height of the ball to within half a centimeter and we're going to uh, measure the time as accurately as we can and and just for a uh, hypothetical argument, we're going to say that we find that the time variation is about 20 milliseconds. So we have this fantastic uh, stopwatch that enables us to measure the time to within 20 milliseconds. A real stopwatch, of course, uh, you'd be very fortunate to get that level of accuracy. Um, and so you calculate G. But the height has some uncertainty. It's only known to within half a centimeter. And the time has some uncertainty because it's only known to within 20 milliseconds. So the question is, what's the uncertainty in G as a result of that? So the point is, uh, if you make a graph of G as a function of the time that you measure, let's say assume that height is accurately known to 2 meters, and then you look at the different times, um, you can see that if there's uncertainty in the time, that that's going to propagate to some uncertainty in G. In fact, you can show here, if the time goes between here and here, the values of G are going to go between here and here. 
Now, the insight that folks had about this and developed the theory of error propagation is that it's the slope of the output as a function of the input that determines the way error propagates between the input variable and the output variable. Because you can see that the, the slope of g versus t times delta t is going to be equal to delta g. So that's the way you do it. You take the derivative of g with respect to time, and then you multiply by the uncertainty in the time, and that gives you the uncertainty in g. If you do that for this example, in this example g is 2h over t squared, so you take the derivative with respect to time, you get 4h over t cubed. It's only the absolute value that matters because the fact that the slope is positive or negative doesn't really affect the propagation of the uncertainty. It's just the magnitude of the slope that counts. And so you go through and calculate all that. And one thing you notice, if you reformulate this in terms of the uncertainty in g and the uncertainty in t relative to g and t, you'll notice that sigma g over g is sigma t over t times 2. And if you fish back through the math, you'll discover that the reason there's a 2 there is because t here has a power of 2. It's that 2 t squared. If you think about it, if it were inversely proportional or proportional to t, a 10% error in t would produce a 10% error in g. But because t gets squared, that error gets compounded. And so the uncertainty in g, if t had an uncertainty of 10%, g would actually wind up with an uncertainty of 20%. Okay. The other thing that happens is sometimes there's more than one variable. If you have more than one variable, you need to combine those uncertainties in quadrature like this, sort of like the sides of a triangle. Um, and if you follow the math, you'll find that a similar behavior exists. If you have a bunch of variables taken to different powers, the uncertainty in the result divided by the result squared is the sum of these pieces, where each piece gets multiplied by the corresponding power. There's an n for the relative uncertainty of a, there's an m for the relative uncertainty of b, and there's a p for the relative uncertainty of c. So if you apply that to the case of g, where h comes in at power 1, t comes in at power 2, you'll see it just you just get sigma g over g is sigma h over h, so it contributes linearly. Uh, and then twice sigma t over t because of that power of 2. And if you plug in all the numbers from our example, <coughs> what you find is that because h is 2 meters and we know it within half a centimeter, right? So that turns out to be an extremely tiny uh, factor. Uh, one part, what is it? Uh, it's 0.5 centimeters over 200 centimeters. Um, and then for, uh, for the time, it's 0.02 seconds over 0.64 seconds. So the, uh, you end up with 1 400th here squared, 1 16th squared. But when you add 1 400th squared to 1 16th squared, the 1 400th squared doesn't really make any difference. And so it turns out the uncertainty in the height is not meaningfully significant. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we could have even worse, we could just have, uh, golly, 1 over 2 centimeters, that would be uh, uh, 2 centimeters of uncertainty, that'd be 1 over 100, it'd still be insignificant compared to 1 16th. So it's the time error that's the real trouble here, and that gives us the lion's share of the uncertainty. So that means we end up with, because of this, uh, we end up with um, more than 5% error here, something like 6 or 7% error because of the time. Okay? So uh, then the other point is this. Let's suppose we use these uh, times that we measure, uh, or I'm sorry, the g's that we measure to calculate the variation in g with respect to altitude. Let's go back to the original problem here. This is the thing we're trying to do. We're making measurements of time and distance, but we're trying to calculate the variation of g with altitude. So we want to uh, determine what is our uncertainty in those parameters of that linear fit. Then we plug in the times that we measure, we plug in the heights that we measure, and we try to estimate that. Now, for the purposes of this part of the experiment, I assume that we somehow manage to improve the time measurements to, within, to make them accurate to within one millisecond. And the heights 
we measure to within one millimeter, which is five times better than in the original example. Um, and I plug those guys in, and I do propagation of error, uh, propagation of uncertainty, or propagation of error to find the error in the G. And then I go ahead and do the fit. Um, there's the there's the original fit, right? And then in order to estimate the uncertainty in the parameters, what I can do is um, re uh, redo the fit over and over again in order to uh, get a statistical distribution of parameters. Now notice what I'm doing here. I'm saying that I'm going to fabricate some uh, G's. I'm going to take the G that we, the, the fit G, and I'm going to add a random distribution of uh, noise around that that has the magnitude, the, the variation in the G values is going to be sigma G times a normal distribution. Um, and remember, when you multiply a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one by a value, what you're doing is just bumping the standard deviation. So what I end up with is a normal distribution with a standard deviation of sigma G. I add that to the model G and I get a Monte Carlo version of G. G star is the, go back here, boom, boom, where is G star calculated? G star here. It's the model <coughs> of uh, the Y values, the G parameter, and the A parameter. So this is what our model predicts. In other words, G star is this line that goes, this is the best fit line through the data. So what we're doing is saying, I want to fabricate some new data that's variation around that line. And then for the Ys, I want to pick new Ys that have the variation about the original Ys. And I'll do that curve fit many, many times. In this case, a thousand times. So I'm going to reproduce the curve fit a thousand times using data whose statistical variation is the same as the statistical variation that's in my real data. So I'm going to use sigma g and sigma y, which are the uh, standard deviation of the g's and the y's for my actual data. I'll redo that fit over and over again, and then I'll make a histogram of the fit parameters. So what, what this tells me is that in those Monte Carlo fits, the G varied from about 9.74 up to about 9.84. So I know my, uh, my expected value of G, 9.79 here. Um, I really don't know it super well. I know it's going to be somewhere between 9.74 and 9.84, but there's significant variation there. So that means that I would, that gives me an idea of what the uh, variability is of that fit parameter. But notice this is something like <coughs> 0.02 out of 10. So I actually know it pretty darn well in terms of relative, that the error compared to the value is, is fairly small, right? 10% uh, error would be 0.9, 1% error would be 0.09, so this is less than 1% uncertain. Okay, what about the A though? The A is that parameter that uh, how much does G vary with altitude? And you'll notice that A is quite small, but even more than that, here is 0, and here is negative 0 0.00002, so I know a is somewhere between here and here, but <laughs> the fact that zero is included means that um, it's pretty weak. The value of A, <coughs> the possible values of A include zero, which would mean that that really would be no effect at all, that the G doesn't depend on altitude at all. It looks like it does, in fact, depend somewhat on altitude, but the uncertainty in that actual dependence is quite high. The uncertainty is on the same order of magnitude as the actual value. So uh, we don't have a lot of faith that we know this thing really super well. Does that make sense? So anyway, Monte Carlo error estimation just means redo the fit over and over again with fabricated Monte Carlo data that you use to uh, simulate the effect of, having, of doing the experiment many, many, many times. That's kind of how you could think of it. Okay, so the exercises this week are to uh, use error propagation to estimate the error in the area of a thermal cover that you cut out 
that has a certain width and height and a certain uncertainty in the width and height, then you're going to estimate the uncertainty in the area. So that's a simple error propagation calculation. Then uh, you've got some x and y data. It's just linearly related data. But there's uncertainty in the x and y values. And I'd like you to use Monte Carlo estimation, error estimation, to estimate the uncertainty in the slope and the intercept of the fit to that data using the same basic approach where you, it's just in this case you're going to have, how, how do we do it? We're going to have a y star and then this will be um, sigma y and here we'll have a x values and then sigma x. So x and y are the data so we're going to have Monte Carlo x, Monte Carlo y. You're going to redo the linear curve fit many many times then you'll take the slope and intercept from that fit put them into lists and then do histograms of the slope and histograms of the intercept to uh, evaluate the uncertainty in those parameters using Monte Carlo. All right, that's all I have for you. Please be sure to ask questions if you have any and we'll see you guys soon.